So here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So it was a travesty of justice uh, told in this case. In May of 2023, a man was arrested in Pflugerville. His name was Raul Meza, and police labeled him a serial killer. So on May 24th, uh, I answered the homicide mainline, and the caller stated, my name is Raul Meza, and you're looking for me. Meza described his life in and out of prison and said, I quote, I got out in 2016. I end up murdering a lady soon afterwards. That lady was Gloria Lofton. Sonia Houston is her daughter. There have been a few circumstances in my life where I have let out what is truly a wail, not a cry, but a wail. And um, that was one of those circumstances that occurred. And even though it's years later, clearly it still Im impacts me. Police records show that on that phone call, Mesa says Lofton's case was not investigated as a homicide and was misidentified by police. A medical examiner's report from 2019 found possible evidence of strangulation and a sexual assault kit tested positive for male DNA. In fact, in May 2020, three years before Mesa was arrested, police records show the detective investigating the case found a DNA link between Mesa and Lofton. But that detective did not act on the lead and police say Meza went on to kill again in 2023. Interim Police Chief Robin Henderson publicly apologized for the handling of the case. I can't imagine that the, the community or the, the family would think that this was, this was, oh, okay. But the fact of the matter is that officer cannot be disciplined for the misstep, even one that might arguably have saved a life. That's because it happened more than 180 days ago, and deep within state law is a provision that officers cannot be disciplined for things that long ago. Instead, the internal APD investigation into that detective now goes in the officer's personnel record, known as a G file. Within any officer's G file are confidential records, including complaints against officers that are unsubstantiated and any investigation that doesn't result in discipline. That includes the internal investigation Austin police conducted into the Raul Mesa misstep. Last year, Travis County voters approved the Police Oversight Act, which would make that G file and that internal investigation a matter of public record but that's still being worked out in the courts now. Do you think that this is an argument for uh, opening up that transparency from the police department? I can see how, how there, there is that connection, if you will, but I can also respect and value that this is what the state law standard is. Do you feel like you deserve access and the public deserves access to that investigation? Most definitely. It's almost like it's this hidden file. Why is it so hidden? and it needs to be public record. That question of transparency within the police department is at the center of a fraught relationship between the city of Austin and its police department. Tonight, can the city of Austin and its police department come to an agreement on a path forward? Officers feel like they haven't been supported. He's taken seriously or we wouldn't be at the table. Our exclusive interview with Austin Mayor Kirk Watson on a police contract. No one should interpret a hurdle as not taking them seriously. And who will be the next person in charge of the Austin Police Department? We sit down with Austin city leaders and ask them about what direction they see the city heading in. We are one of the safest cities of our size in the country. I do not feel safe in this city. All that tonight in a special edition of CBS Austin, Blue City, the state of public safety in Austin. More than 300 police officers short within the Austin Police Department. Add to that, another 150 jobs unfilled within the entire department, and the job at the top of the department remains unfilled, with the city of Austin closing in on two candidates to be the next chief of Austin Police. Behind that, it's been 482 days since the Austin Police Department last operated under a contract. The city and the police union are back at the negotiating table now, but a deal is no guarantee. My co-host this evening, CBS Austin's Michael Atkinson, covered the back and forth for months now and spoken with APD, city leaders, and the Austin Police Association. Michael, the key question here is transparency and really how much the department should have here. Both the city and the police have said that they want transparency within the department, but how much transparency has been arguably the largest hurdle to overcome? More than a year ago, Austin voters approved the Police Oversight Act along significant margins. That act would make those personnel records, the G-File, public record. But the city hasn't made those records public yet, prompting a legal battle with a divide between the voters and the police department. State law is still controlling. And as of right now, a, because the court cases are all still pending, 
that material is all still protected and state law says very explicitly that it cannot be released. In the state law, the provision on G files says that police departments may maintain a personnel file that would be private. That word may is at the center of the debate over the Police Oversight Act and the group behind the act, Equity Action, has sued the city for not fully implementing the law. Because it doesn't say that they have to maintain a G file and now our law says that they can't maintain a G file, uh, that they should stop maintaining a G file. And that disagreement is now the culmination of years of a fraught relationship between the city of Austin and its police department. In fact, it's hard to separate the Austin Police Department's year of attrition from the summer of 2020. Black Lives Matter! After the protests of May of 2020 following the police killings of George Floyd and Austin's Mike Ramos, the Austin City Council cut its police department by $150 million. With all the issues that we've had going on, I don't think it's been any secret that officers feel like they haven't been supported. Travis County District Attorney Jose Garza, whose office presided over the indictments of more than 20 police officers, ran on a platform of police accountability. Last December, Garza's office dropped the charges against 17 officers. Instead, he, the Austin City Manager, and Mayor Kirk Watson requested the federal government investigate the Austin Police Department. I'd love to just hear you explain the thinking behind that of why you think that that was the best path forward. There are a number of ways to, to make sure things are transparent and the people know what happened. But another would be to have sort of a pattern and practice review uh, by a third party look at, look at it. Four months later, Garza handily won the Democratic primary for a second term as district attorney, signaling that Austin voters aren't through with police accountability. That's an interesting question because I don't think I will be looking for a police chief. Still ahead, the two finalists for the Austin Police Department's top job. And do city leaders and community activists think Austin is heading in the right direction? Our town hall on the state of public safety in Austin. I want someone who's going to, one, be transparent, uh, two, uh, understand the work, full stop. In just a few days' time, we should know who Austin City Manager T.C. Brodnax is selecting to be the next police chief for Austin. Nearly three dozen candidates applied for the top job from across the country. This week, we heard from the two finalists, Cincinnati's Assistant Chief Lisa Davis and Milwaukee's Chief Jeffrey Norman. That's how I would do that. Get that morale up, you'll start retaining people, and your recruitment efforts will go up as well. And I'm going to be that leader going to sit there and tell you every day, thank you. The city manager's office today said it would take more time to review the two candidates after previously expecting a final decision by next Tuesday. We know we have vacancies. Mayor Watson talks 911 wait times and his plan for getting your family help sooner in an emergency situation. That's in our exclusive interview right after the break. I called 911 the other day. Uh, it was it was good that uh, I didn't need fire or uh, EMS uh, in this situation, but it took over four and a half minutes for me just to get on the line with a dispatcher. That was over a year ago, three months before the Austin City Council requested a formal report evaluating 911 call taking. That report from the city auditor's office, which came out earlier this year, revealed 911 calls increased in 2023. The number of calls per 911 call taker, in fact, had a wide range wider than the likes of Dallas or Houston. But new data provided to CBS Austin by the mayor's office does show progress so far this year. Between 91 and 95 percent of 911 calls were answered within 15 seconds or less, and vacancies are down. When I sat down with Mayor Kirk Watson, I asked about any lessons learned from the 911 call takers that can be applied to the police department staffing crisis. Can we take anything about the way the process sure. worked and apply that to the shortages within the Austin Police Department? We know we have vacancies. That's why you do what we did last year. One of the things is even out of contract, you pass an ordinance that goes ahead and says, we have your back, don't worry about pay, we're even gonna give you a pay raise. And it's the reason that we have always said, let's get to the table. Tonight, we are joined by city council members and local community activists. We also have a live studio audience made up of a diverse group of Austinites who will get the chance to ask questions of our panelists. 
Cleo and Chaz, I want to start off with you. I want to get the pulse of the feeling here. Is Austin safe? So Cleo and Chaz, let's start off. Uh, Cleo, what's the perception? Are we in a safe city? I don't believe so. I interact with a lot of victims groups and um, there is a feeling that um, everyone has a story of either their home being burglarized or their car uh, taken. Um, a feeling that if you call the police, they will not answer. Um, t 20 years ago, I was physically assaulted by my ex-boyfriend and I had to call the police, Addison police in Dallas. And I remember when I was crouched down in the, in the, vet, in the bathroom that I was afraid for my life, but I knew the police were going to come. And I can't tell you how much I am terrorized that if I call the police, that they will not quickly respond if there's an intruder in my home. And I have a 10-year-old child, and my husband travels a lot. So believe me, that is, a, that is a pressing thought in my head every day when I go to bed. Jazz, what do you think? Are we doing a good job of keeping this city safe? Uh, well, you know, not, not my opinion just going off facts, because I, I actually looked this up yesterday um, when we were talking to the police chief. One of the candidates is from Milwaukee, um, which happens to be one of the like, top five most dangerous cities based on homicide rates. Um, and, you know, to, to Cleo's statement, you know, it sucks that some people are still um, experiencing, you know, dangerous situations and being burglarized and harmed because, you know, we don't want that. I, think, I don't think anybody in this room wants that. Um, but when you look at the stats, like Austin is still like top 15, like top 20 safe cities compared to like other big cities. And you know me, I'm a pretty staunch critic of our police department. Um, and I know some of the issues that they claim that they have, staffing numbers resources, but um, they, they still seemingly seem to be doing a good job based on stats, right? Like, I think we're going in the right direction. Council members, you obviously play a key role in the conversations with the police department. I'd love to get your assessments on what you make of those comments. We'll start with you, Councilwoman Kelly. Yeah, I, I like Cleo, hear from people who are in my district every day that are concerned about increased response times. Um, we are moving in the right direction as far as recruitment goes. Uh, we are far away from 2020 when the city council before I was elected, before Council Member Vela was elected, chose to defund the police department by $150 million, took away 150 vacant positions, and um, stopped all the police cadet academies. That was absolutely catastrophic to stop the cadet academies. While we needed to reform the curriculum, we didn't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and that put us really far behind in recruitment, which has led to where we are today with a staffing crisis. And Cheeto, what do you make of public safety in Austin? It's a largely safe city. We are one of the safest cities of our size in the country. Uh, going off of uh, Chaz's comment, our two APD chief finalists are from Cincinnati and Milwaukee, both of which have much higher murder rates and generally speaking much higher crime rates than Austin does. When you compare us to virtually any other city in the United States, our uh, crime rates look better than just about any other city in the United States. Now, of course, that's not good enough. I mean, we want Austin to be a safer city. We want to continue to invest in public safety measures. We want to make sure that uh, police response times are uh, appropriate. Uh, but the reality is that today, Austin is one of the safest cities of its size in the United States. And we'll have more coming up after the break. Is Austin heading in the right direction? We'll have more on that next. In just a few words, is Austin heading in the right direction? We'll start with you, Cleo. Um, the fact that we can have a meeting here and have different perspectives, but still feel like you know we are we have a right and a seat at the table, I think shows that we we, we are headed in the right direction because you know we're we're here discussing it, and that's a part of it. We need to be able to hash things out. And, and, and like Chaz said, we need to hear from people that we might not agree, but their, their points are just as valid. Their experiences are just as valid. Cheeto? Austin is, is one of the best cities in the United States. We are moving forward in a positive direction. There's gonna be missteps, there's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be bumps and problems, uh, but fundamentally, uh, in so many areas, you know, culturally, uh, health-wise, just the, the fabric of the city is, I think, stronger and better than it has been. And I think we're moving in, in the right direction and that trend will continue. I'm cautiously optimistic. I think we have a few things that are on the horizon that are going to be great for our police department, including the selection of a new police chief and a four-year contract, which should both help with morale. 
I also believe it'll help with recruiting and retention of our officers. And, you know, like Cleo said, being here and being able to talk about it really helps put all the ideas out on the table and helps us learn from one another so that we can invest in this beautiful city that we all call home. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. Um, the fact that we don't politically agree on many things, but we can have this conversation, um, whether it gets heated at times. Um, one thing I know for sure that everybody up here, um, including you two gentlemen, uh, we love this city, right? We love the city and all its imperfections and all its hypocrisies, um, and we love the people in the city, whether we agree with them or not. Um, and the fact that uh, we have one of our premier um, news stations in the city willing to carve out time to do this with, um, I'm, I'm going to say diverse <laughs> group of people behind me, um, I, I think that's what makes Austin special, right? Like this is that little bit of weird that we need to keep um, because not many places are doing it. So, you know, thank you to CBS. Thank you all for um, shining the light on what makes Austin Austin. We all love Austin and we all want to be safe. Thank you for your comments. We'll be right back. Blue City, the state of public safety in Austin's town hall will be streaming in its entirety online immediately after the show at 7 o'clock at CBSAustin.com. The city and the police union have been back at the negotiating table since March after already more than a year without a contract. Now, four months on, those discussions still seem at an impasse. So we ask stakeholders, where do we go from here? I think we have made progress in that time frame. Uh, but I feel to a degree we're not being taken as seriously as we should be. I don't know why he feels that way, um, but, but he's, he's taken seriously or we wouldn't be at the table. I think the council has made it a priority. Uh, I believe me coming in, uh, I share that sense of urgency on getting that done. If a contract comes forward that doesn't have the Police Oversight Act implemented it, to the fullest, not, it's not getting a vote. I don't think anybody would bring that to the council. How long? Can the Austin Police Department keep going in this direction before it hits a wall? I would say we're on, we're on the brink of disaster now. We're there. Thank you for joining CBS Austin, our town hall event, Blue City, the state of public safety in Austin. I'm Walt Makaborski. And I'm Michael Atkinson. Tonight, we are joined by city council members and local community activists. We also have a live studio audience made up of a diverse group of Austinites who will get the chance to ask questions of our panelists. Cleo and Chaz, I want to start off with you. I want to get the pulse of the feeling here. Is Austin safe? So Cleo and Chaz, let's start off. Uh, Cleo. What's the perception? Are we in a safe city? I don't believe so. I interact with a lot of victims groups and um, there is a feeling that um, everyone has a story of either their home being burglarized or their car uh, taken. Um, a feeling that if you call the police they will not answer. Um, t 20 years ago I was physically assaulted by my ex-boyfriend and I had to call the police, Addison Police in Dallas. And I remember when I was crouched down in the, in, bed, in the bathroom that I was afraid for my life, but I knew the police were going to come. And I can't tell you how much I am terrorized that if I call the police, that they will not quickly respond if there's intruder in my home. And I have a 10-year-old child, and my husband travels a lot. So believe me, that is, a, that is a pressing thought in my head every day when I go to bed, especially when my, uh, my husband travels. Response times are slower. This APD wants them about 10 minutes. They're around 12 to 13 right now. Jazz, what do you think? Are we doing a good job of keeping this city safe? Uh, well, you know, not, not my opinion, just going off facts, because I, I actually looked this up yesterday um, when we were talking to the police chief. One of the candidates is from Milwaukee, um, which happens to be one of the like, top five most dangerous cities based on homicide rates. Um, and, you know, to, to Cleo's statement, you know, it sucks that some people are still um, experiencing, you know, dangerous situations and being burglarized and harmed because, you know, we don't want that. I, think, I don't think anybody in this room wants that. Um, but when you look at the stats, like Austin is still like top 15, like top 20 safe cities compared to like other big cities around the, the country. So, you know, even still, and you know me, I'm a pretty staunch critic of our police department. Um, and I know some of the issues that they claim that they have, staffing numbers, 
resources, but um, they, they still seemingly seem to be doing a good job based on stats, right? Like top 15 safest cities in a big country like America, I think we're doing, I think we're doing okay. I think we're going in the right direction. Council members, you obviously play a key role in the conversations with the police department. I'd love to get your assessments on what you make of those comments. We'll start with you, Councilwoman Kelly. Yeah, I, I like Cleo, hear from people who are in my district every day that are concerned about increased response times. My district, District 6, is the furthest from the center of the city. We're the furthest from a traditional police substation. And as such, I actually worked over the last year and a half with the assistant city manager over public safety to get a temporary public safety engagement center in my district, which will help increase response times throughout our area. Um, we are moving in the right direction as far as recruitment goes. Uh, we are far away from 2020 when the city council before I was elected, before council member Vela was elected, chose to defund the police department by $150 million, took away 150 vacant positions, and um, stopped all the police cadet academies. That was absolutely catastrophic to stop the cadet academies. While we needed to reform the curriculum, we didn't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that put us really far behind in recruitment, which has led to where we are today with a staffing crisis. And Cheeto, what do you make of public safety in Austin? It's a largely safe city. We are one of the safest cities of our size in the country. Uh, going off of uh, Chaz's comment, our two APD chief finalists are from Cincinnati and Milwaukee, both of which have much higher murder rates and generally speaking much higher crime rates than Austin does. When you compare us to virtually any other city in the United States, our uh, crime rates look better than just about any other city in the United States. Now, of course, that's not good enough. I mean, we want Austin to be a safer city. We want to continue to invest in public safety measures. We want to make sure that uh, police response times are uh, appropriate. Uh, but the reality is that today, Austin is one of the safest cities of its size in the United States. If I may push back on that, um, when you think about the critical incidents that have happened, like the mass shooting in Sixth Street, there are areas of Austin that were without police for hours. Okay, if you have a bank robbery happening in South Austin and a home invasion or a serious critical incident in North Austin, we do not have the staff currently to be able to respond to critical incidents. Um, we also have had our governor who has had to step in with state troopers when, and they did a study during the time that they were uh, involved in assisting officers with uh, 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 patrolling areas and, and, and uh, a, a police presence, crime went down, right? So obviously the number one way to prevent crime is to have police presence and to be able to respond to calls. If our, before the staffing crisis, we had a response time of 6.44. It is now 10 and a half and, or 11.30 uh, according to March uh, records. So obviously the time that it, regardless of if the crime, if you say you feel if it, the, the crime is not or what it was bef uh, in a, compared to other cities, you have to see that I do not feel safe in this city. I do not feel safe if I know that police are not going to respond. You cannot just look at crime statistics and use them to be able to echo whatever talking points you have. You have to look at the staffing numbers. We have 500 staffing crisis. We, ha we do not have a police chief. We do not have a police contract. We're not able to recruit officers. So we're, we're, we've got to go down to the level here of leadership, you know, and buy-in. So talking about leadership, police chief, right? We have two candidates now who are the finalists. Are they qualified? You know, Lisa Davis is from Cincinnati, population 309,000. And then we have Jeffrey Norman is from Milwaukee, population 563,000. Are they qualified for the job? Are they qualified to take over the city and run this? We were a little city for a long time, but we're quickly growing to be a big city with big city problems. Mackenzie, is he, are they qualified? Well, I absolutely believe that their background shows that they are qualified. Do they have the experience necessary to lead a city of Austin size? I have my doubts. I'm hopefully, um, you know, looking towards our city manager to really determine whether or not these two finalists are able to take on the job. But something that we have to remember is that Austin has unique challenges that are different from other cities. Um, for example, we have 
very vocal individuals who care passionately on both sides of how policing is done. Navigating that alone is definitely something that a candidate who takes this position is going to need to be able to understand. And also the morale is an issue at the police department. And like Cleo said earlier, we still don't have a four year contract. Our officers have no incentive to stay other than the ordinance that city council passed related to pay and benefits. They need that four year contract, not just for solidifying what they're doing there day to day and ensuring that they can continue to work there, but also as a form of a recruitment tool. We need that so that new recruits know what they're going to be paid and have. And, and to Cleo's point before, outside of the police chief, we're one cascading failure away from an incident in the city that overwhelms our public safety department. And that's scary. Uh, you sound like you want to respond? Yeah. The police effectively and appropriately respond to hundreds, if not thousands, of calls every single day. The vast majority of serious crimes in this city, there are arrests made and there are prosecutions. Uh, and there are, I agree that obviously a serious incident, uh, uh, a number of serious incidents, I think about the mass murderer that drove up from San Antonio and started randomly uh, uh, murdering people here in Austin, are going to overwhelm uh, the capacity of for example, APD in and of itself. But that's where we have our partners. We have uh, Austin ISD police. We have Williamson County police. We have Travis County sheriffs to respond and support APD in those kinds of incidents. So this kind of idea that, you know, 1,400 police officers or whatever is dangerously, that, that's just not true. Uh, it has not been true in any incident. The police have uh, responded appropriately to every major incident, even if it means having to leave lower uh, priority calls on hold for a bit. Again, but uh, the, the police are doing a, an, a good job of, uh, of managing. And again, this idea that we don't have a police chief, we have a, a very good interim uh, police chief in uh, Robin Henderson. Uh, Chief Chacon, I thought, also did a good job. And, and whoever comes next, whether it be... Uh, uh, whether it be the police chief from Cincinnati or the police chief from Milwaukee, they're absolutely capable and qualified to uh, lead the department. We just have to decide who we want. As we're deciding that exact question, who we want, there's obviously a short list of attributes that folks are looking for. This is a question I think really anyone can answer, but I'll start with Chaz, which is just what are some attributes that you would say are non-negotiables for you and what you would look for in a new police chief? <laughs> um, th that's an interesting question because I don't think I would be looking for a police chief, but um, uh, explain that if you will. Why wouldn't you? Be I, looking I, for I think I think everybody up here knows my, my views on um, policing. You know, I'm 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 very proudly an abolitionist, which means that I want to continue to to, to force us, um, encourage us to think um, a, 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 of a society of a world beyond policing and prisons. Right. Um, also understanding because a lot of people stop right there. Also understanding that like that that's not saying that police and prisons are going to stop tomorrow. But I think it takes all of us, right? It takes me, it takes the council people like McKinsey and people with different viewpoints and, and, and political um, ideologies to understand that public safety is not just up to police, right? I think that's where we often um, fail as a society, right? We put so much on these men and women in uniform to, to, to you know, believe that they can amazingly somehow um, stop all the issues in society, right? Um, but, but public safety has to be a unified, community-driven effort that we all buy into. Um, but to answer the question about the police chief, um, I, I think Austin needs two things. I think we need a person that can manage um, a police department of people. Um, you know, I, I do understand that the morale is low. I do understand that um, there are some budget restrictions, right, or, or, or resource restrictions, right? We need somebody that can come in and work with what we have. Um, and manage the things when we get them. The, let's manage the resources better when we get them. But we also need a visionary leader, right? We need somebody that's saying, you know what? Policing in this way that we've done it for millennia is not working, right? Um, let's keep in mind, like, Cleo doesn't like stats for whatever reason. I think that's interesting, but um, a real number, a real actual number is 1,352. That's how many people were killed by police last year, right? It was a record number. Um, so something we're doing in policing doesn't work. Um, and we also have to understand, and I have to give a shout out or, or credit to, to Lisa from Cincinnati, because when I asked the question about the budget to the, to the two candidates, um, you know, Mr. Norman was like, that's not my job, right? Like um, I said, you know, in Austin, we've been having conversations around alternatives to policing, which means we need resources to fund these alternatives. And how would you approach that? 
and he was and he said you know not my job right the budget is not my job the budget is what it is I'm gonna take well, what I got we're gonna do what we do um, but Lisa said you know what I, I get that and I hear that right um, if there's a way for me to work with um, community groups and alternative groups to policing I'm all for that right and I think we need more of that because again um, let's say we never get to the staffing levels that we need for the police department let's employ other people in the community that we trust our neighbors community groups that are doing this work around the country like we have real life examples dream defenders in Miami right groups in Milwaukee that are doing this work um, and I think we need that I think we need a police chief that understands public safety does not belong um, exclusively to the police department it has to be a community effort Thank I think that's what we need I think we need a leader Cleo you obviously yeah. have uh, made sure. made a career out of discussing what police departments need I'd right. love to hear your thoughts right. well, uh, what, to Chaz I live in reality and we will always need a police department my best friend was murdered in front of me when I was a teenager so obviously I believe that there are there is evil in this world and we need to have the ability to call and there will be police to answer uh, when, when you call them and that is my concern my most concern with what the situation here in Austin is is that we have response times that are unacceptable and the best way to do something about that is by hiring a police chief that will be able to be a tool in recruitment and retention of our officers by increasing morale also by being an active uh, in, involved in community engagement making sure that they are responsive to the community um, but also feeling that officers feel that they're being supported and right now they're not they're not being supported by city council members when they're when they do when you see uh, the chief Henderson interim chief uh, will send a, a, a communication out that this officer showed uh, exemplary work or courageous you don't see any of the council members except for McKenzie retweet that or acknowledge when officers do excellent work which they do every single day we did hear from each of the candidates, the finalists for police chief mm -hmm. this week, and I believe we have some sound from each of them. I want to start with Lisa Davis, the candidate from Cincinnati. You get that morale up, you start reta retaining people because again, people leave their people leave their supervisors. They don't leave the jobs. We'd love to unpack that a little bit more. Chaz and Cleo asking you guys specifically, what do we say? You guys have both talked about the morale of the police department. Let's start with you, Chaz. Just how do we build up the morale among police? Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, and I'm glad this is recorded. I think I agree with Cleo here, right? <laughs> I think we, um, I, I think I, it, it's important for me for the morale of the police department to be high because if we have happy, sound men and women in uniform that's out patrolling, that mean to me, that means that the community is going to be safe as real, right? Um, if we have officers that are not feeling appreciated, that are not feeling seen and heard, um, and then they get this high stress call, um, the, some of that anger and frustration, some of that not feeling seen and heard can then reflect on the community. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I, I think from the few police friends that I have, um, I, I think they just want to um, feel like some of their concerns internally are, are actually being heard, that when they bring issues to um, the chief, that, that, that the chiefs are not just listening to community folks like me, which has never happened since I've been around. but. Um, that the chief is also um, taking in consideration the time we're in, but also the very real life situations that these men and women are in as well. Um, and can take that either to city council or just stand up for it. You know, I think any person that works for any company or organization wants a boss that's gonna stand up and, and, and at least fight for them, right? So um, yeah, I think morale is, is critical to have because I think it keeps all of us safe. All right, Cleo, you heard right. Chaz says he agrees with you. Yeah, <laughs> Do you agree with him? And it's on tape. And I appreciate he has done ride-alongs. So has uh, Chitos. Um, everyone here, I don't know if you guys have, but we've all done ride-alongs. We all speak to patrol officers. Uh, the number one way that you are going to boost morale is by passing a four-year contract. Last, we have, officers have been without a contract for a whole year. Last year, they had one of the most progressive contracts in the state, and that was by the labor negotiation attorney. That, that said it was, right? W Austin Police has had a history of having the most progressive oversight. They have led the cause for that. They want oversight, right? The, the, the misconception or the feeling like, oh, police don't want to pol be police, that's, that's incorrect. That's never been a part of the equation, especially for the police department. They are, they are courageous for the job that they do, regardless if they have a contract or not, but the best way to boost morale is to show them that by, by, by actually passing a contract. Why on earth would you not have one by now? We're going to get to that in just a second, but we also want to get to the other candidate, uh, Jeffrey Norman from Milwaukee. Here's sound from him. 
what is important when you're dealing with staffing issues is what's the tone of your city in regards to supporting those particular departments? Do you have a unified message? Do you show the support to those who are putting in the work? Mackenzie, I want to start with you. I want to talk to the council members. Are you guys supporting the police department enough to, to get things done and make it happen, do you think? I feel like I'm doing above and beyond what it takes to help support our police officers. I hear from them on the regular about things going on in the department, which I can then take to city management and let them know what I hear. Um, I'll give you an example, National Police Week. I'm the only council member who sent out a email of appreciation to our officers on council. Um, you, I go out of my way to stop and talk to officers to thank them if I see them out and about. Um, I really quickly would like to address Councilmember Vela's point about us not uh, about us having enough officers. We have several departments that have been cut. We don't have a DWI unit. We don't have detectives who are able to focus on detective work. They are all being put back on patrol and our officers are going call to call to call and their morale is low as a result of that and other factors that we've talked about tonight. I think it's very important to ensure that as a leader, as a council member, we are taking those extra steps to ensure that the officers feel that their concerns are heard and that their voices are heard so that we can get back to a place where they feel that they're listened to. Are they, are they being heard? Uh, they are being heard uh, by myself and by my office. One of the first things when I came into office was I wanted to have a uh, good communication, a good relationship with the police officers, particularly the ones in my uh, district. Uh, in Austin we have something called district representatives where there's a police officer designated to a certain sector of the city uh, and we meet with them regularly. We have gone on patrol with them. Uh, I communicate them. I want them to know what I'm hearing from the community. I want to hear what they're hearing from the community and what they're seeing about. And that A good relationship starts with communication and we have been reaching out to them, talking to them, uh, trying to understand where they're coming from uh, from uh, day one. And, and I, I agree with, uh, with Mackenzie that uh, there are uh, officers that are running around trying to do their best in uh, difficult situations. But honestly, that describes just about every city employee in Austin. There's a lot of departments that are under-resourced, but we have to get creative and we have to get efficient and we have to be smarter about how we deploy our resources. The police department is the biggest department, both in terms of personnel and in terms of budget. Uh, so that's really where we need to be. How are we handling uh, our call responses? What is our priority? Which ones can we potentially shift over to civilian response and not send our highest paid employees, uh, uniformed armed police officers out to the call? Instead, let's send a mental health expert. Let's send you know, uh, someone to help uh, do forensics, to help kind of in investigate a, a burglary and give somebody you know, the, the response and information that they need. We have to look at those kinds of tactics if we want to uh, manage the department appropriately and also, I mean, hold our, uh, uh, our finances steady. I mean, we, we, you know, we talk about, uh, you can't talk about an unlimited uh, amount of funding for the police in uh, today's day and age where the city faces very serious financial headwinds from limitations that the state has put upon us. So we've just got to be smart about how we deploy our law enforcement resources. And we want to talk to our audience members now. What do they want in a police chief? What are the problems you see out there and what kind of leader do you want? Question? Yeah, so um, definitely want a police chief that can um, uh, unify and boost morale. But to speak about morale, I think that um, maybe sometimes we're being a little bit tone deaf. If we're gonna say that morale is down simply because there's not a, uh, a four-year contract in place, but ignore um, that uh, morale is down across the country. <laughs> All major uh, police departments are uh, understaffed at this time. This is a national trend, this isn't a local trend. Um, and it might have something to do with the Sonia Masseys of the world. It might have something to do with every time someone thinks about becoming a police officer and then they see something like that happen 
that they say, you know what, I don't want to be a part of anything like that. So what we need in a police chief is someone who can fix the culture. Mm -hmm. Fix that culture to where um, there is some real accountability and not um, paper mache put up to show some form of um, uh, accountability. So when we talk about oversight, that means that we won't, uh, that the police won't uniformly uh, be against an officer being bought before a grand jury. That's the judicial process. That's a judicial process that has, uh, you know, been around as, as long as the Constitution of the United States of America. And so they should go through that. Um, there should be some accountability when something is wrong. And if not, just like every other individual in the community, they can be exonerated and elevated and lifted and placed back in their position and, and go on and do, can continue to do good work. But until we come to a place where that can be accepted by the police department where one of theirs can actually be charged and it not be um, uh, us versus them type of thing with the district attorney's office and the media and the community, but that it can all be um, uh, done seamlessly and in community with the rest of the, the, the community, how everyone is looking at it. Yeah, that's what kind of leader that we need. Someone could boost morale and make sure that the community can feel safe, even from the police. Cleo, I'd love to get your reaction to that, specifically just talking about accountability. Um, surely you don't say that officers shouldn't be held accountable at Absolutely. all. So where do you balance that? Right. I don't believe that, and officers also believe that there should be accountability. City council members should be held accountable when, they don't, when they're not a part of making sure that there's a contract passed. We should not be without a contract right now, right? Everyone should be held accountable. Um, especially when you have officers who have agreed to a, 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 a co police contract with the most accountability in the state, right? No one beats us in that. And the fact that that has been left on the table is a problem and the reason why we are not able to recruit officers. Um, yes, mo absolutely, o officers are afraid of that decision if they're ever going to have to go in front of a grand jury themselves. Of course, that's a, that's a part of it for officers that I've talked to. But also, there is a, every year has been increasing threat against officers. We've had more officers die in the line of duty than ever, right? Currently, the national trend, not ever, but like in, the national trend has been going up, right? Their officers are in, in a precarious situation more than ever. Um, I do feel like the, the accountability question, whether they, th this to me is really hard for me because I see every day officers that act with courage and bravery and, and empathy. And, and I, it's hard for me to see that, that, that there is a, a question of that they don't want to be held accountable when they have chosen in their police co contract to have the most accountability in the state. What's the problem here? Why can't we get a contract together? You know, the Austin Police Association returned to the negotiating table in March four months ago, but we're still kind of in this no man's land of not getting a, a contract together. How confident are you guys that we'll have an agreed contract soon? Uh, uh, I'm uh, confident that we will have uh, a contract soon, but the reason that council and uh, I led the charge on knocking down the prior contract uh, was the reason the council did that was because the contract was going to undermine the voter-led initiative that was going to demand a level of transparency an important level of transparency and accountability if that contract would have been accepted just months before the vote then the uh, Prop A, which uh, the, again brought a level of transparency and accountability to uh, Austin law enforcement, would have been just a dead letter law from the moment it was passed. We stopped that contract because before we entered into any kind of contract, we wanted to see what the people of Austin had to say, whereas the people that were trying to push that contract were trying to undermine the will of the voters. Uh, ultimately, we were able to push that contract back, and again, that Prop A passed with its very uh, tough measures of uh, transparency and accountability, passed with, I can't remember, Chaz probably remembers, but 79%, 80% of the vote. This is what's wrong with our current um, 
form of government with the elected officials that we have and what I'm constantly in conflict with on council, and that is that they push and push and push against state law to try and do things that are very progressive and are in direct conflict. And as such, we don't have a contract today. Yes, the voters wanted increased police oversight, but it was in direct conflict with state law, which has prevented us from being able to provide a contract. We want to turn it now to our panel of audience members here, ask a question about the level of accountability. Obviously, we're talking about a police contract that has accountability in it. What do you guys want to see come out of these negotiations now that both sides are back at the negotiating table? Well, I'd like to actually respond to the prior uh, question about what we need in a new police chief. Uh, we need a police chief who's willing to represent their officers and, and other, other police uh, uh, employees to the city, the city manager and city council. All these problems that we have in terms of crime in Austin are self-inflicted by our city council. Years of demoralizing, decimating our police department. And I'm sorry, uh, council member Vela, if your standard is how we rank, you go tell that to somebody who's been, had a child that's been murdered. Nobody cares about a ranking. We want to be as safe as we can be. And this whole thing about that proposition, hey, that was illegal. City attorneys said it was illegal. We need a police chief who can stand up to city council and hopefully not get fired for it, for speaking the truth about what's going on with our officers and crime in the city. Council Member Vela, a response? Very soon. I hope we have a contract that implements the transparency and accountability, accountability provisions that Prop A demands. I think we're going to have that. This idea that it is asking something that's just above and beyond the pale for police officers is just not based in reality. DPS has the level of transparency and accountability uh, that we are asking from APD. Travis County sheriffs uh, also do not have a lot of the, the protections and the, uh, the, 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 the uh, transparency that uh, APD has. In other words, APD, the level of transparency and accountability that we're asking for from uh, APD uh, is similar to what a lot of other police departments, both in the state and in the country, have. There's nothing in there that's illegal. There are absolutely elements that we have to negotiate with the uh, police union, but if they're okay with it, we're okay with it. There, this has nothing to do with being legal or illegal or anything. It's just something that we have to work out at the negotiating table with the police association. Two things. Uh, number one, the G file. Okay, this has gives citizens the right to access their police officer's address, and we've seen mayors and council members' house protested. Um, would you, as an officer, want community members if if ever came a, a, an incident, a critical incident, would you want community members responding to your house um, and getting your information, things like that? So that's Number two, excuse incorrect. me, excuse that's me. That's completely incorrect. That is absolutely not true. The uh, addresses of law enforcement officials are private. Uh, in addition, they can even have their names removed from the property tax records to where you cannot even, if you look for the home address of someone that you know is an officer, they can ask for it. So the, I, again, this is, no, no, their personal information is not going to get out. What we're talking about is their disciplinary records. I don't want to know the, and I don't, in, and no one wants to release a home address of a police officer. I want to know what their disciplinary history is. I want to know how many complaints have been filed against them. I want to know how the department responded to those complaints and what the actions that they took to remediate any kind of negative behavior by the police officer is. Again, these are just this complete misinformation that somehow we want to release the personal information of police officers that's completely incorrect. Walt, if I may, real fast. Um, I, my esteemed colleague has very valid and salient points. However, I do believe that when he compares the Austin Police Department to DPS or to Travis County, he's comparing two completely differently structured organizations. Um, we at APD fall under collective bargaining, and as such, 
things like oversight need to be um, negotiated for at the table. And so to compare that to other organizations in law enforcement that do not have that is just wildly inappropriate to me. I understand the need for looking at disciplinary files. However, the protections of the G file are such that unsubstantiated complaints could be in there. Mm -hmm. And that is scary for some officers to have released because if they're unsubstantiated, they could still be marks against the officer. And to me, I believe that if we negotiated for that to be kept secret and to be kept under file with an internal affairs investigation still happening, then they deserve to maintain that privilege. Uh, well, so, Ch I want to ask Chaz, Chaz, you've never really been happy with the transparency. It, it doesn't seem like it. When we, when we talk to you, it seems like you want more exposed. Are we doing enough to find the balance between not only protecting our officers, but just making sure that people know what's happening in the department? Um, well, <laughs> you just make it seem like I'm hard to please, which I might be, but, um, I, 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 and I, I've said this before. I think Austin, like Cleo said, like everybody up here said, um, Austin's police department over the last 10 years through Black Lives Matter movement um, and post-George Floyd has been one of the most progressive police departments, right? Like when you look at boxes that they're checking, when you look at Obama's 21st century on policing, when you look at PERF, when you look at national um, um, indications of progressive police departments, Austin is leading the way. However, right, like Austin, Texas, I think can be an example city of what a just, fair, um, really safe city for everybody looks like, police, community members, everybody involved. And I'm always gonna want us to do more, right? I think, I, I, even though, you know, me and Cleo and Mc McKenzie don't agree on everything, I, I believe that we agree that Austin is a special place, right? I think we all believe that Austin can lead the way in how we have, um, or how we could have a truly transformative ecosystem of criminal justice, including the police department, right? Um, so I've, I've always been a, a, a probably annoying voice um, for the city council and the police department um, to just be better, like constantly be better. Like, yeah, in, in 2001, um, you did a really cool thing with, with some stuff but like, let's be better, right? And then in 2007, um, 2017, you did some really cool stuff, but like, let's, let's continue to be better because again, like Bill said, um, Sonya Massey was killed in her house yesterday. Um, this is not Austin, um, but Sonya Massey, a black woman was killed in her house yesterday by a police officer when she called them for help and clearly was going through a manic episode, right? Um, and I, I think, you know, those examples um, for people, not just black and brown, but for a lot of people, those images of police doing that to somebody that's in desperate need um, really, to me, continuously remind us that we have to be better. We have to rise above the occasion. Um, and I, that's all I want Austin to be, right? Let's be as transparent as we can possibly be. And to the gentleman's point about the law, I just always think it's very interesting um, when people bring up the, the legal issue, oh, like, that's not legal, it's against the law. Well, you know, it used to not be legal for me to walk through the front door of the studio, let alone be in it. And like, now here I am. It, it, was, it was not legal for somebody that looked like me to run away from, from, from their master, right? So, like, laws are meant to be challenged and pushed, and I think that's what um, Equity Action did with the Police Oversight Act, and I think that's what the people voted for. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm confident, um, maybe foolishly, that the city's gonna find a way to um, make this work so we can get a police contract. Um, and that both the, the folks at Equity Action and, and folks in organizations like mine and the community can all get what they want. But we have to keep in mind, like, our laws are only um, a, a, a moral outline of who we choose to be. And with stuff like the Police Oversight Act, we're asking ourselves, we're asking our city, we're asking our institutions to, 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 to broaden them a little bit so we can be better than what we currently are. So, and I'm confident we'll get there. We always, we always do. We are, with that, want to turn it to the public again to hear some more about transparency within these police contracts. Where do you guys think transparency should begin and end when it comes to holding police officers accountable and, and getting a contract accomplished? Well, I'd like to first say that um, I would like to see a chief that, that um, is willing to compromise. Um, the community shouldn't be held hostage or underserved because the far left and far right are playing political games. And at this point, the community members are the only ones that are losing. And Chaz, you know, you and your organization recently supported the home initiative despite opposition from historically marginalized community members. Uh, while you acknowledge that the city of Austin didn't effectively engage 
with those community members or incorporate any of their ideas, you endorse the home initiative and argue uh, that in the name of housing justice, action was necessary even if it wasn't perfect. Uh, given that perspective, where do you think the compromise should be when it comes to this police contract? Um, I understand the G-File, I understand pushing back against the laws, I understand that the state uh, we would be violating state law by, you know, having a contract uh, with that doesn't expose the G file. But where is the compromise? If we were able to compromise and get housing done for the housing justice perspective, why come we can't compromise and get a contract done so that m vulnerable community members aren't just left to be victimized? Gito, you, know, you think you think we're close? Uh, I think we're very close, uh, and I think that. The, the G file is, uh, God, I hate to get too deep into the weeds because I know folks, but point being, DPS does not have a G file. Travis County Sheriffs don't have a G file. The vast majority of police departments, their personnel files are wide open. Uh, that's what we're asking of APD, of APD to have their files as wide open as DPS has them, as wide open as uh, Travis County Sheriffs uh, have them, uh, as the Dallas Police Department has them. I think we're going to get there, though. Uh, the, I think we're going to get to a contract. This is part of, uh, as Chaz was pointing out, kind of a cultural shift, a cultural evolution. We used to police a certain way. Uh, a very uh, aggressive way. I've heard it described as kind of the, the warrior mentality. We're trying to shift to a different model of policing, kind of a, the guardian mentality, where your job is not to go out there, you know, with the billy club and just, you know, smash some heads. Your job is to really kind of investigate, to find out what's going on, to, to, to do more than just respond with aggressive police tactics. We're looking for a police department that is gonna be uh, de-escalatory in its approach of trying to tone down the violence, of trying to make sure to not uh, use force when there are other options. And, and Alex, as he mentioned, we've had a lot of wins. We're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and I think when we do get the contract, and I think it will be uh, happening hopefully sooner than, uh, than later, that will be an important time for us to put aside our differences and come together and break bread and, and move forward. Cleo, your body language yeah. says you're... We are a year into uh, a lack of compromise by my, be my belief that we have a lot of far left council members that it's all or nothing. That means council, uh, community members, I interacted with Stephen earlier, and we have community members that you might think that stats, you know, whatever you think, I, I do believe in stats, but you can use stats for your argument. And I do believe that if you call police, they might not answer. And for a community member, they were broken into several times. One of the times the police officers took 30 minutes to get there, right? So, you know, this, you tell that to victims that yes, we do not feel safe when we do believe, when we call police, they might not come. Um, number two, uh, there is no compromise, right? Why not compromise by having the contract parceled out? The parts that are illegal or, or, or that can be challenged, why don't you take that part out and have the rest of it that they have, both sides have already agreed to and have the city council pass that and let the courts decide whether or not to, to enforce that part that, that needs to be challenged. What, what Chaz believes, you know, maybe the courts will agree with your standing on the law, that it, it, it's not 21st century law, whatever, whatever your, the case may be. Uh, that is something that could have been done a year ago because a lot, a lot of what Prop A, uh, the equity action, is already in the contract that, that they left on the table. A lot of those provisions were in there. That is why it was the most progressive oversight in the state. Our studio audience, we're talking about transparency of, a, of an initiative that was passed more than a year ago. To what level do you think that transparency should be a sticking point in a police contract? Sure, thank you so much. So the, the police contract, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation to me because as a survivor of police violence, um, I don't like the idea that police transparency um, has to be incumbent upon a, 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 a dollar sign. I think that that shouldn't be a bargaining chip when we're talking about community safety. Um, that transparency should be a given without there needing to be 
money involved in the discussion. When I worked um, as a as a teacher in a specialized learning center for kids with and, ki and adults with behavioral challenges and had my life threatened on the job, I didn't need a email <laughs> to say thank you for the hard work you're doing for me to do a good job and to to um, stay in my job. Um, so I would love to see um, us talk about transparency and oversight and the safety of communities who, you know, communities in Austin that don't feel safe calling the police um, when something happens. We, I would feel much more safe in the city if I knew that the lion's share of our budget, for example, wasn't just going to police. It was maybe instead going to those items that um, would prevent violence from happening in the first place. I don't want my car broken into, but I also don't want anyone in Austin to be hungry enough to have to break into a car. Um, I don't want um, kids to be um, uh, struggling with mental health issues to the degree that they have to use substances um, to get through the day, right? I want our schools to be supported. I want our neighborhoods to be safe for everyone. And I want everyone to have a safe place to live, including like literally a roof over their heads. And we don't have that right now. And it takes a lot of money for us to have all those things for everyone. Um, and so while the police continue to take up the lion's share of our city budget, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think a contract is is should be um, the the priority right now. I think it should be the community. Is this a tale of two cities? Is this a, is a tale of the haves and the have-nots, and some people getting preferential treatment over others? Are we not prioritizing mental health enough? I know the city really embraces um, mental health, um, and they're trying to find money for it. But when it comes down to the brass tacks, and we look at we're one of the biggest cities with you know, 500 police officers that we need to fill, how do we, f as you say, find that balance to not only protect the people that are going through a mental health episode, mm -hmm. but also protect people that feel disenfranchised by policing in the community? Well, well, I can tell you the city of Austin was the first city in the entire country that now when you call 911, you are asked if you need police, fire, EMS, or mental health. Proud to have been on a council that was able to make that possible. I'm proud of the investments that we're making in that. Mental health is always going to be a priority of mine. Um, and I think that it's something that we all on council care about based on the way that my colleagues and I have voted. Um, there are ways that we could utilize that mental health option to step in for duties that the police officers are using. Um, we are learning every day ways to improve on that. And I have no problems with you know, continuing to seek other ways to have individuals do duties that don't require them to be sworn officers. But really, I think when you step back and you take a look, the 30,000 foot view of what's really going on, we do need to ensure that individuals who are experiencing crises have the help and support that they need before it gets to the point that 911 is called and it's the worst day of somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, I, th this, this idea of, of, of compromise um, in a police contract, um, and, and you know, I'll say it like this, right? I, I think for, for most people, um, me included, you know, up until I got grown enough, um, I grew up on Carl Winslow, right, from Family Matters. Um, Carl Winslow was the neighborhood cop, always, you know, everybody loved him, you know what I mean? And for the longest, um, growing up in elementary, the cops would come to school, fire trucks would come to school, and I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty cool, these are people that help people. Um, and I, I would probably argue um, that up until Trayvon Martin and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there was a large swath of youth and young adults that still wanted to be cops, right? But thanks to technology, social media, body cameras, and just being able to see the world um, at a little bit more of a raw form, I think those sentiments have changed. And for me, to answer you know, one of the questions that were brought up earlier, um, for me, right, as a black person and black people are not a monolith, I'm not, first of all, I'm not in a position to compromise because I'm not at the negotiating table, right? People like me and Cleo have our platforms and our viewpoints on the outside, but we're not at that table. Um, I'm not compromising um, the safety of anybody. Um, in the name of, of money, right? Like, I, it, it's my belief that as a police officer, um, your job is to protect and serve, right? Even if you don't believe that. That is my belief about um, police and peace officers in this country, and it should be. And the moment you decide to breach that trust, like, there's no negotiation, right? I think if you want an extra 50 bucks to learn Spanish, 
an extra 50 bucks for, you know, different pair of pants on your uniform, $100 if you do a, the 40 hours of mental health, okay, take all that money. But, like, that ha there has to be some hard line that says when you breach the trust of the community, right, when you cause bodily harm, when, you, when you're rude and crude for no reason, like, there has to be a hard no, right? Like, and I agree with uh, uh, Alicia, right? Like, why are we negotiating how we get to discipline the bad apples, right? Like, I, I, I just think it has to be a hard line for the bad apples. And again, I think that's what equ Equity Action did. I think that's what the people voted for. Um, and again, I think that's the biggest holdup in the contract right now. And again, I, I'm, I'm confident that the city will find a way to, to make this all work. But for me, there's no compromise when your job is to keep people safe and you breach that, right? Like, because uh, again, all people want, on both sides of the ball, I think, if we agree on, on nothing else, is that um, we all know that bad officers over the last decade, for sure, thanks to body cameras and, again, TV coverage of, of police brutality, we want the bad cops to be held accountable. On both sides of the ball, red, blue, purple, whatever. And I think that's all we're asking for in Austin, right? Again, I, and, and Cleo, believe it or not, I agree with you. I don't think people should be going to people's houses whether you're a mayor, police officer, you've done something wrong, I don't agree with that. That's not my form of activism, right? But like Cheeto said, like the only thing we're talking about with the G file is we need to be able to access your disciplinary files to make sure there's not a pattern of something here, right? Because if we have access to that information, we can pick up on something, right? And again, if we're able to pick up on that, we believe that we're also to keep people safe even further, right? So, but yeah, for me, I'm not compromising people's safety, whether you're black, white, or whatever. There's no compromise in that for me. Another part of that is the actual pool of makeup, the oversight board. I'm a former probation officer. I can't be a part of the, uh, the oversight board, but a felon can, right? So, somehow they believe that I won't have an uh, impartial view if I'm on the board or, or be able to see you know, the big picture and be able to be a part of the, the oversight. But somehow a felon, someone who was arrested and, and has a view of, of criminal justice or police does have a right to be on there. That doesn't make any sense to me, nor to, to, to the people involved in the police contract negotiation. That is a non-negotiable for them. On the beginning of this newscast, we share the story of Gloria Lofton. She was a woman who was sexually assaulted and murdered, police say, by Raul Meza. She had been, she had received a DNA test, and in 2020, they found a link between Miss Lofton and Raul Meza, but the detective in charge of that case did not act on that tip for three years, and ultimately Raul Meza was according to police, went on to kill again and was only arrested last May. So that officer, because it happened more than 180 days ago, that investigation that AP did, APD did now goes into this officer's G file and the public, the media, nobody can access that investigation. Cleo, I'd love to get your thoughts. Is that not an argument for the Police Oversight Act? We, don't, we can't see what happened with this officer's investigation. I think more has to do with, in my belief, that the criminal investigation, you know, whether or not something should be out to the public yet if, if this has been uh, there has been jurisdiction over it or, or adjudication uh, happening I, that is from my understanding why this hasn't been released or why the information is still private or, or unaccessible not accessible I, I would to that point tell me another profession where just because you did something wrong you know after 180 days you're not going to be fired you're not going to be disciplined you're not going to be anything nothing's going to happen to you I'm not aware of any profession or any employer that would think that that's a, a reasonable policy. If you did something really bad and it was two years ago and I'm just finding out about it, I may need to fire you regardless of it, if whether it happened two years ago. So I, I think that's a, a great example of why would we just arbitrarily pick 180 days and say, oh, that's after that. If we don't find it within 180 days, you're off scot free. To me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I've talked to a lot of officers who say, look, get the bad apples out. We don't want the bad apples in here anyway because it makes us look bad. And then it casts a shadow upon everybody. Um, we just wanted to get a quick update. You know, we had a graduating cadet class and we just got a, the new updated number. They say the vacancies now are 342, not 500 for clarification. Right. So the, the reason I say that is because we had 150 that were cut and have not been, uh, they returned the, the, the budget that was 150 million that was cut. but they, uh, in 2020, right. when our Sorry, council thank you. decided to defund the police department and move forward with $150 million that they took out of the budget to reallocate to different places, they also removed 150 vacant positions, I see. which so have not been returned. Would, so that's that 340 plus right. And if you look at any study, uh, City of Austin has also had studies in regards to how many officers 
per thousand, and we are way below that threshold. Uh, even when you look at the allot, even if we fill the, the 342, we still are not with national average for the, the size of our city. Not keeping pace. No. And, and, and let's just be clear. Yes, the council did vote to, to reallocate um, some funds from the police department, but the government came in and made a law that said it's not possible. So just want to make sure we're talking facts. I'm sorry, Chaz. When somebody takes money out of my bank account, I call it defunding. Uh, call it, okay. We'd love to mm -hmm. get on to another topic, which is the trends of violent crime here in Austin. The, we are seeing early numbers that show violent crime is trending downward from a peak in 2020. That is a similar trend to what's going on nationwide. Uh, Chaz, would you say that Austin is the exception, or is this kind of just part of a broader trend that everywhere is seeing less crime? Um, well, I, I think... Um I think it's a national trend based on some stuff I was reading um, over the last week or two. Um, cr crime is just going down. I, I don't know. I don't know why that is. Because um, I, I think with everything going on in the country, I would imagine it would go up. But again, there are there are some pretty um, you know intense places like Milwaukee, um, Cleveland, Ohio, where where crime is is still high. Um, but Again, like, but, but this is just like human American nature, right? There are moments where crime is going up. There are moments when crime is going down, and we are in a pretty overall safe area now. And, and again, to address what Mackenzie and Cleo said earlier, um, I, I want to be clear that I'm not um, forgetting or um, pushing aside the stories of the people that you all talk to. Like, those are real people that are experiencing very real traumatic um, situations. But... Um, and again, I would never tell to a person that's telling me that they've been burglarized or sexually assaulted, oh, well, look at the stats, right? I think we also have to honor those people's real life um, situations. But um, nationally, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a trend that, that crime is not happening at the rate that, that we think it is. Um, and it does suck that yet and still um, there are people that are being affected by crime and people that are being hurt, right? And I think ideally, again, I think we all agree that um, the ideal situation is to have crime be at zero, right? And I think for me that means that, um, you know, one, we have to have a police department and force that can show up in the really bad situations, right? Like when we had the Austin bomber, um, I don't know if you want me out there looking for the guy, right? I don't know if you want <laughs> some of my friends out there looking for the guy. I think those are when we need professionals to come in. But um, in situations of domestic violence, so like imagine a, a neighborhood and a society where instead of calling a number and waiting you know, let alone six minutes, 13, 20 minutes for somebody to come, we can rely on our neighbors to come in and mediate those situations, right? So again, like for me, I think, um, and maybe that's ideal, maybe I'm crazy, but um, I, it, it just makes more sense to me that the person that's sitting right here next to me um, can, can be more of an aid, um, or at least be um, a, a thumb on the situation until help comes in. Um, and I think the more we see more of that, we can get to this ideal situation of zero, right? Let's ask our community, are we, to Chaz's point, are we not good community citizens helping our neighbor? Or is there, is there such, is there, well, I, I'm talking about, you know, responding to crime, that's a, that's a really tricky issue. I want to help my neighbor, but I don't know if I want to get in the middle of that dis it's domestic dispute. No. I don't know if I want to, I don't know my neighbor that well because I'm secluded and maybe I, I didn't know they had a mental issue. Are we doing enough as a community? Go ahead. You know, my question really uh, as to this conversation is with accountability. And this, this certainly reflects on what is the trickle down effect on the community. So I'm wondering, are there no longer reporting requirements now under the Biden administration as to crime? Are there no longer some really specific reporting requirements that now look like all of our cities are safe. We know that our cities are not safe given the uptick, uptick in rape cases across the country with a mother who, had, who was a mother of five who was brutally murdered. I'm wondering what the city of Austin can do with recording such things. If the federal government is now no longer requiring some of these reporting requirements to make it look like we are all safe, given the uptick with crime, truly, we've all seen it. And with our open border situation, is there a way that the city has decide, can or should document the crime, specific crimes with the general population and crime with the illegal, uh, with the migrant population that's coming across? Just a note, I do know that the 
local governments do offer statistics to the FBI for a NICS database, and that then goes to then. It takes a while for that information to come, and I believe the most recent FBI data is from 2022, but that does come from local governments that's reported to them on what kinds of, of things are happening, such as the Chief's monthly report. That number will then go to the FBI. Well, and truly, I, I think, though, that we, we can't have 2022 reporting requirements. We need to have these requirements month by month done by our city. We need to have active active reporting so that we all can see that we can talk about it collectively as a community. Yeah. Walt, if I could speak to that, our police chief, no matter who it is or who's in the interim role, releases a report every month called the Chief's Monthly Report. And so those numbers are available. I would state in regards to if we're a safe city or not and the dispute over the uh, statistical data, there is a large difference between an individual who has experienced a crime and doesn't feel safe as a result of that and somebody who perceives themselves to be in potential danger of a crime in lieu of statistical information. And, and so whether I think, the police will respond. Correct. And that, so I that, think that that's that a very the... personal situation. Now, I've been in a domestic violence dispute before where I felt extremely unsafe. My neighbors did not feel comfortable coming over. Um, I've heard neighbors of mine in an apartment complex where it sounds like somebody's getting the living daylights beaten out of them. I don't feel safe going into that environment. And so I do believe that we do need to have police officers who can respond to that. Um, the last thing that I would want from a public safety perspective is for an individual who has no experience or training in this type of thing to try and de-escalate a situation. Um, their own personal safety should come first. Um, as a first responder myself, that is something that I was always taught and told. And while I may have a different background and training than everybody else, I would not voluntarily put myself into a position where I too could be injured. Sure. Sure. So, so, so can I um, to my good friend Mackenzie, um, great you, friend, you, you know, I, I think I, I hear you, right? Um, it, but I, I think for me, um, I think that's part of a broader problem, particularly in this country. Um, um, I, I had the pleasure of going overseas um, last year. Um, I went to Barcelona, Amsterdam, and um, Paris. And one thing I did not see. Um, and maybe I was just in some nice places. I, I don't think they were extremely exquisite, but um, I didn't see many homeless people. And I was like, I was asking people like, what, like what, what's going on with this? Like, why don't y'all, like where are the, you know, like what, why, do, why don't I see homeless people? Um, and they was like, well here, um, we s also see this person as our neighbor, right? This is, he's part of our community, they're part of our community. Um, and you know, going to conversation, just really learning how they, they're, they're connected, right? It's like all my relations, right? There's no uh, black and white, like we're all Parisian. Even when I was asking like, where were the black people from Paris? They was like, what are you talking about? What's a black Paris person, right? Um, and so it was just like, again, we have this uh, misunderstanding in this country that um, we operate in silos, right? Like if you're my neighbor, um, and I didn't get this growing up. When I, when I grew up with my grandma, um, walking off the school bus, all these old people would be on the porch, you know, just waving at me, making sure I got home safe. And I didn't understand. I was like, man, these people are nosy. But the <laughs> older I get, um, I realized that they were doing that because I'm, we're part of a village, all right? It's part of their job and their duty to make sure I get home safe. And I think, like, you also have the right um, to be concerned about your own safety. Um, absolutely. But then the flip side of that, Mackenzie, is, like, we're asking people in uniform to go do that. Right, so it's, it's just like something has to give. We're asking other people to literally risk their lives to go out um, and potentially not come home in the name of Cuban essays. Like, why are we not um, also, you know, beckoned to pick up that call as well? And I think, again, once we understand that we are quite literally all we have, right? We are, we are so much more than institutions, government, uniforms, badges. And the, the quicker we are able to understand that um, Cleo, McKenzie, um, as much as we disagree, like you two are my neighbor, you are my sister, you are my cousin, um, I, I think we get to a place where public safety is way more um, real and meaningful than this conversation we're having um, and, and more than just people in uniform, right? I think we, we have to be willing to put ourselves on the line because you do it every day. You go up there and um, in an Austin City Council with you being who you are, um, I could argue that, that, that you put yourself in danger a little That's bit, right. right? Like, at least politically. <laughs> right. Like, politically, right. you say things that are not 
um, of the of the Austin fabric. And you know, we re we have to respect it because you're our um, what we call in the black community our crazy cousin that we love, <laughs> right? And and so it's like we have to be willing to step outside of our own comfort zones and our own safety to make sure we keep each other safe because. Again, we're asking people um, in uniform to do it day in and day out. And I think we help alleviate some of their stress and their stressors um, by being able to go check on my neighbor before we pick up the phone and call them to come in, right? Because they're coming in extremely cold. But, you know, at least if you're my neighbor, um, there's some rapport, or it should be. Chaz, right? I think it's very disrespectful for you to talk to Mackenzie that way. She was elected by constituents that also believe in a lot that, that she believes in. Number one, and we, I could say the same about you. I'm a Democrat. I, I just don't believe a lot of how you have, I was a member of your group up until uh, five years ago when you said you wanted to abolish the police, which I do not support. We will yeah. always need, and hey, in this country, there will always be a need for police officers. And, and, and Cleo, I agree with that. And also, Mackenzie is a good friend of mine. I was joking, so you know, if you were offended by that. Um, I was. I was going to clarify, I did get elected by my district. I, I know. Yeah. There are yeah. many so people that believe Austin, like her. Just not yeah. the whole majority of Austin. Yeah, you know that. You'll much. see when I'm mayor one day. In oh. the interest, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that afterward. In the interest <laughs> of time, we do want to turn back to the studio audience for another question. Yeah. How do you guys, do you guys feel safe uh, in Austin and the crime rates going down? Do you see that visibly? I don't really see yeah, yeah. that trend. I recently talked to a community member whose house was burglarized and uh, you know, it took two weeks for a detective to get back to her because um, you know, the claim was that they were on patrol, they have to do patrol and they're, they're overstaffed. But you know, there's, a, there's a difference between ideas and reality. And we, the reality of it is, is that um, if my alarm goes off at my house, no one from either, either far left or far right organization is gonna show up and make sure that my property is okay, make sure that my kid isn't killed. No group is going to do that. It's going to be a police officer. That's just the reality of it is. And I think this notion that, you know, us as community members should, uh, you know, step in, put ourselves in, ho in harm, harm's way, you know, it sounds good, but, but we know that uh, in this coward culture world, that's not always going to be the case. So let's create policy based off the reality and not some far left idea. Okay, can, I, can, I, can I respond to that first? Um, uh, and, and this is why I say, you know, not all black people are monolith and he can have his own opinion, but, you know, it used to be a reality that black people were slaves, right? And, like, there was a reality that we would never be free. Um, thank God that somebody had the idea um, and the belief and the crazy idea that we'd be free one day. Um, it, used, it used to be an actual reality that women couldn't vote and own houses. And then, you know what, a group of women got together and said, you know what, to hell with that. We're going to fight for our right to do so. And our reality now is we have a, our first black president and are now a nominee that's a black woman. Yeah, Asian exactly. Woman. So, so like, this like, is our like, reality now. But, but I'm saying, like, even that alone, is a, that used to be a crazy idea. Right. It used to be a crazy idea right that... Right now, we're talking about It used to be a crazy safety. idea, Cleo. I'm almost done, not okay. to be rude. It used to be a crazy idea that a black person could run for the highest office in this country. And he did, and he won. So and all, he was elected. All, all I'm saying is that crazy ideas happen all the time. And he was supported by Republicans, Democrats, Independents. That's how Obama got but elected. But also, and also, Cleo, th th this is the last point, just to, to, to hit that mark. Like, this idea that there are not community groups around the country and the world that are doing this is just completely false. But if people get outside of their own little local bubble uh, um, and, and actually use the Internet, they I can did. see that there are groups I was a no, member no, of no, I'm not talking group. about you. I'm not talking about okay. you, Cleo. I'm talking about the, the I saw statement. what you were about. Cleo, You're a police abolitionist. You second. live in La La Land, and we live in reality. And in reality, we need police department, a viable police department with a police contract. But Cleo, but Cleo, if you were not so stuck on your, like, pseudo-democratic, pseudo-like Republican box, you would know that there are groups in Milwaukee New York. I don't live Virginia. in Milwaukee. I I'm live in I'm just saying, Cleo, Cleo, these and are... I, have, I, Cleo, I was open-minded enough. Cleo, all I'm saying is that there are examples of people in communities that do not rely on police and institutions to keep their community safe. That's happened before the idea of America. That happened when there were indigenous the folks and black folks That is not the reality that ever will happen here in this country. Okay? So we it's need, happening to, we right need now, to stick Cleo, to reality. It's happening right now. It's Let's happening see. right now. Ideas have their place, but not reality. Policy still should be made out of what's going on right now. Let's turn. I want to hear Cheeto. You haven't. Uh, we haven't heard from yeah. you in a minute. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that well, question. T talking about uh, reality and uh, talking about numbers and data, one of the most important developments we've had in policing recently has been the rollout of the new 
Austin Police Department uh, data uh, dashboard. You know, if we're going to talk intelligently about crime, about policing, we have to have good, accurate information. And I sponsored that item to create. We wanted to go beyond the chief's monthly report, just kind of a, a quick snapshot. We wanted to be able to, to dig deep into the data. So now we do have better data where not only are we seeing the number of crimes uh, committed, but we're seeing the locations of crimes committed. We're seeing uh, calls for service. We're seeing different kind of information that the public has access to. So we can look at trends, so we can look at where are the hot spots, so we can know what's going on, not just within the police department, but the public at large. Because it's not just the internal analysis of the police department that matters. I mean, that's very important. They have their analysts that they do their work. But let everybody else, let the public have access to that information and let them make suggestions as to where we should deploy these patrol officers or how should we should respond to these circumstances. So that has been a really important development, the APD uh, police dashboard. Uh, I'm proud to have uh, brought that item. That was unanimously supported by council. So we do have a council that's very serious about public safety, that's taking it very seriously and trying to move forward in a positive direction. We want to get one more question from the audience before we wrap up. Sorry, it's actually not a question. I just wanted to get back to the to the public safety uh, concerns because as a mother of six, when we were sitting here asking about uh, public safety, do we feel safe? I, I don't feel safe. I would not send my children downtown to Austin, to Town Lake, to anywhere walking downtown after dusk uh, just to hang out. And I wouldn't send them in twos to Town Lake either. I mean, even two girls, it's now really quite questionable. So um, as to safety, I don't think we're there. And whatever phone numbers that are being circulated around uh, bureaucrat institutions, I, I think we need to reevaluate the reporting requirements. And are we missing some things? Is it safe to walk after dust? What's your reaction to that? Is it safe enough? I guess depending on your age. I mean, six and 10 year olds, no, but Teenagers, is it safe? Is that a fair question? I'm downtown at City Hall and around City Hall every day. Yeah, also and I hear this kind of, oh, downtown is a scary, like it's not. It's a, a completely normal place. It's, it's largely safe. There's literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that come and go from downtown every day. The idea that it's some kind of hellscape is just a fantasy that people really just need to shed. Of course, this is a major American city, a million people. Of course, there's going to be things that happen that we can't control. And, and, and my, my sympathies, my heartfelt sympathies for anyone who's a victim of crime. But the reality is that people come and go from downtown every day. People live downtown every day. Uh, safely, securely, happily. Uh, I mean, I just don't know what to say about that. There's so many events that happened. Uh, recently, I was uh, downtown for the July 4th celebration. I mean, there must have been 100,000 people down there for that. And I, I don't think that there was really anything that happened except a good time was had by all watching a bunch of fireworks. So this whole idea that, that uh, Austin is some kind of you know, criminal hellscape is just uh, right-wing fantasy material, and it's it just really needs to material. stop. We've no, had it's, it's definitely not fantasy material. There was a time when I had first gotten elected where individuals who were experiencing homelessness were surrounding City Hall. They were carrying metal pipes, they had bulletproof vests, they had machetes, and they would chase me as I walked out of City Hall. That was not safe to me. And that clearly isn't happening now, that the tenure or temperature has changed outside of City Hall. But there was a time where I felt unsafe. And I know there are other individuals who have stories similar to mine, maybe different circumstances, but I met somebody who was punched in the face after he was trying to defend two women walking across the bridge on First Street. There are times where it can feel unsafe to people. And while it is safe at other times, I think that if we were to discredit the voices of the individuals who don't feel safe, it would be at a disservice to the city of Austin. Yeah, I, I, I agree s slightly with Mackenzie, because you know, I think, you know, Cheeto, you and I have to also keep in mind that we're men. Um, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not discrediting the fact that um, if I was a woman walking town like at eight when it's dark, I might feel unsafe. Um, and, and again, I, 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 I do want to point out um, that we have to respect, or we should respect both, right? Let's respect the, the, the data and statistics. Collectively, we're safe, but also let's also respect these stories of the, the individuals that, that don't feel safe. Um, and, and also, too, you know, like safety, um, and people are not going to like this, but I think safety is a very interesting concept to me, too, because, you know, when I talk to, um, and Mackenzie has been there, right? Mackenzie has done me the privilege of coming up to my cigar shop in Pflugerville. 
Um, it's a black-owned cigar shop, East Pecan Cigars. It's a cool place. Yeah, you know, thank you. Um, and and you know, when when I'm talking to the black men in this establishment, um, they don't feel safe in Austin, right? They've been pushed out of their own community, right? And so when they go back to the various pockets of Austin where they're from, they don't feel safe because it doesn't feel like home. Um, I could argue that if if me and Bill was riding around and he has a, a, a nice um, Benz, um, you know, if we're riding around. West Austin at a particular time, we don't feel safe, right? So let, let's also keep in mind that safety is objective, but we should also um, be working diligently as a community and collectively to make sure everybody can feel as safe as they possibly need. And in terms of police, um, again, the, the crazy chat talking, I, I just think we can't and we shouldn't rely solely on police to keep us safe, right? Like, let's also, as much as we want to invest in police and police resources, let's also have um, 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 crime intervention, let's also do like gun violence prevention, let's also make sure we have shelters in place to keep um, our unhoused communities members where they need to be um, and, and you know away from people that, that they may not interact well with, all right, that's a real concern. Um, like we, we have to continually think about creative ways to make sure as many people feel as safe as possible, right? Um, and again, I think, you know, that's going to take a, a collective approach in, in many um, creative ideas. But, you know, I agree with Cheeto and Roma Spick. Austin is a safe city, but also these are real stories. What she's talking about, what Cleo's talking about, what they're talking about, absolutely. And, you know, I also want to just pay respect to those as well. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and so we've only got time for one last question. We want to ask each of our panelists this. In just a few words, is Austin heading in the right direction? We'll start with you, Cleo. Um, the fact that we can have a meeting here and have different perspectives but still feel like you know we are we have a right and a seat at the table i think shows that we we, we are headed in the right direction because you know we're we're here discussing it and that's a part of it we need to be able to hash things out and 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 like chad said we need to hear from people that we might not agree but their their points are just as valid their experiences are just as valid cheeto Austin is, is one of the best cities in the United States. It's uh, in moving forward in a, a very positive direction, such a special place. People love it so much. Uh, we are moving forward in a positive direction. There's going to be missteps. There's going to be mistakes. There's going to be bumps and problems. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, in so many areas, you know, culturally, uh, health-wise, just the, the fabric of the city is, I think, stronger and better than it has been. And I think we're moving in, in the right direction and that trend will continue. I'm cautiously optimistic. I think we have a few things that are on the horizon that are going to be great for our police department, including the selection of a new police chief and a four-year contract, which should both help with morale. I also believe it'll help with recruiting and retention of our officers. And, you know, like Cleo said, being here and being able to talk about it really helps put all the ideas out on the table and helps us learn from one another so that we can invest in this beautiful city that we all call home. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. Um, the fact that we don't politically agree on many things, but we can have this conversation, um, whether it gets heated at times. Um, one thing I know for sure that everybody up here, um, including you two gentlemen, uh, we love this city, right? We love the city and all its imperfections and all its hypocrisies, um, and we love the people in the city, whether we agree with them or not. Um, and the fact that uh, we have one of our premier um, news stations in the city willing to carve out time to do this with, um, I'm, I'm going to say diverse <laughs> group of people behind me, um, I, I think that's what makes Austin special, right? Like this is that little bit of weird that we need to keep um, because not many places are doing it. So, you know, thank you to CBS. Thank you all for um, shining the light on what makes Austin Austin. I think we can all agree that we love the city. We all want to be safe and we want to thank you for watching. We want to thank our panelists and members of the public for joining us tonight. This has been a CBS Austin Town Hall event, Blue City, the state of public safety in Austin. Have a good, safe night.